find out what he did for a living, there's actually a photo of it, it just gives me the EBGB's uh, filling uh, airplanes up with fuel in the air, strapped in with a seatbelt, you know, that's how they did it in the 50s and 60s, so, but uh, I'm glad that you're here. Um, we are celebrating the life uh, of uh, a husband, uh, the life of a father, the life of a grandfather today. Uh, a long life, um, I don't always get to do funerals where we get to say, and you know, this was a, a life well lived, and um, the day that I got to pray over him, um, encouraging him to go be with Jesus, uh, I looked at his wife and I said, well done, you made it. Uh, not a lot of marriages today can say that they fulfilled the vow until death do us part, but you did it. And uh, she's so sweet, they said, yeah, we fought a lot, but, uh, <laughs> but then we made up. So, um, and you know, that's real life, that's real marriage. And um, I wanna share a verse from Job. Uh, who understands what it means to suffer, who understands what it means to lose. In Job 1.21, he says, The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And during suffering, it's hard to thank God for the gift of a wonderful grandfather, father, a husband, um, because we have this sense of loss, um, this sense of absence of this amazing individual. But the reality is, Everything that we feel lost from is a reminder that something was given. And so today we want to honor God and say thank you for a wonderful man, a faithful father, a faithful husband, just a great man, a great grandpa. Um, I mean, what a testimony when grandchildren are crying because grandpa was still there, still a part of their lives. And that doesn't, you don't see that a lot in our day, in our age, in our culture. And so we're celebrating what God has given and we're grateful. And uh, I'm particularly grateful um, and I'll talk more about it in my sermon, but, uh, you know, Emory made a decision uh, literally the day before he died or on the day of his death to um, give his heart and life to Jesus Christ, which is just amazing. Um, and so I'm grateful to that that happened, and I know his family is as well. So I'm going to open us up with uh, a word of prayer, and then I'm going to invite Melissa to come on up, and she's going to share the eulogy. So would you just bow your head and close your eyes with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for... Uh, Emory, um, we thank you for the man that he was, uh, the life that he lived. Um, Lord, I'm just so grateful to see, Lord, the tears of grandsons, um, daughters, and, and his wife testifying to the fact that he was a faithful man, a loyal man, and I just am grateful for that. Lord, we thank you for him. Lord, we know that he's in your presence, God, and I pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort us as we say goodbye. Uh, to someone who has loved so well and so deeply. Lord, please bless this uh, time with your Holy Spirit and just anoint us, Lord, with your grace, um, especially for his wife, his daughter, uh, his daughters, Lord, and his, his grandkids. God, we just ask that your spirit would move, Lord, through the eulogy, the songs, the stories, 
uh, the sermon and the video. And God, I just pray that um, we would all evaluate our lives uh, in, the lo- in the reality of the fact that life does not go on forever. We thank you for this, God, and we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Good afternoon. <clears throat> For those of you I haven't met, um, I'm Melissa, and I'm the daughter of Emory Sun Leo. And I'd like to share with you just some highlights about my grandpa and his history. Um, it's really hard to conven- condense everything about such an amazing man into just a couple of minutes. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to hit the high points. Emory Hess, grandpa, was born August 13, 1929, in Glendale, Arizona. As a three pound preemie, he wasn't given much of a chance. He told us stories of being put in a Buster Brown shoebox in the oven to be kept warm enough. Obviously, God had a plan for him. At the age of 14, he left home, began working for a stable. He started out mucking stalls, grooming, working his way through to become a jockey. He traveled around racing and uh, even met a few Hollywood A-listers. In 1948, he joined what was then the Army Air Force and saw through the final transformation from the Army Air Corps to the U.S. Air Force we know today. He began his nearly 23-year career as a gunner on the B-50 Superfortress. He was a pioneer in air refueling, first in the B-50, then the KC-97 straddle tanker, and later the KC-135. In April 1952, He married Alberta Little, Grandma, and together they served several assignments and had three children, Leo, Christy, and Terry. And despite the demands of service and no modern technology like cell phones, Grandma says he was there for the birth of all three kids. He's a veteran of the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, and was on flight status during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He could tell many stories of near misses and slim escapes, and obviously God had a plan for him. After his Air Force retirement as a senior master sergeant here in Riverside in 1970, Grandpa kept on flying. He got both his private and commercial pilot licenses. He flew, instructed, ferried, and sold airplanes. And I can remember as a little kid at the house in Robinson, standing out by the pool, and he would shh, and he could tell you what kind of aircraft was flying over just by the sound of the engine. He loved. His post Air Force career also included work in furniture as a welder and electrician. He and Grandma enjoyed traveling. They, they went to reunions to visit with his old Air Force brothers. They took cruises. Emory became a grandpa in 1974. I don't know which one of you was that old. <laughs> Over the past 40 years, he's opened his arms and his heart to eight grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. He treated us to ice cream, donut runs, and shared everything but his chocolate, or at least pretended he wouldn't. <laughs> Most importantly, he loved to share his stories, and his legacy will live on through those. His service to his country continued in volunteer hours at March, like at the theater and with the USO, His patriotism inspired his son and three grandchildren to follow him into military service as well. Obviously, God had a plan for him, and now he is called home. Home to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, and congratulations, Sergeant Hess, on this, your final promotion. I love you, Grandpa. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed.
shocks me to see how much of a hero my grandpa was with his uh, friends that are here that saluted him the casket and stuff that really touched me showed me that he's a amazing uh, servant to our country and an amazing grandpa so uh, I'm going to read this poem for him oh I have slipped the surely bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings sunward I've climbed and join the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds, and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared, and swung high in the sunless silence. Hovering there, I have chased the shouting wind along, and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up, the long, delirious, burning blue, I have topped the windswept heights with easy grace where never lark, or even eagles flew. And while the silent lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space. I put out my hand and touched the face of God. Love you.
you would think that with pancreatic cancer, he'd be sad or in pain or anything. It wasn't uncommon for him to crack a joke or go eat some ice cream three times a day or some cheese it or whatever he wanted that day. But one thing I know he always had to have was his coffee. And there's been points where he'd go to the hospital for just something small in comparison and he would be very cranky if the nurses wouldn't give him his coffee. It was required. There was points where I remember sitting down at the table and we'd be all having a conversation. He'd just randomly start telling a story, whether it's about flying or uh, buildings he's put back together and flooding in the buildings and rats and his stories are never ending and I wish all of you could have heard every story he's ever told me as well as every story he's ever told all of us and I wish that I could listen to even more stories but I'm so happy that I got here just in time to say goodbye and that's what I needed and I know that he waited for Danny and I. <sighs> Grandpa, he will always love all of us, whether he's here or not. And I know that right now he's here. I mean, more than just in a casket, he's here <laughs> hugging Grandma and explaining to her about the price of everything. <laughs> He's so excited because he's finally giving her away with everything she needed, though. And I love both him and my grandmother. And I love my aunt and my mother and my sisters. My nieces and my nephews and my cousins. And I love that he was able to make such a big impact on so many people's lives. And I love that he did such amazing things for this country. And I love my grandpa. There's so much love in this room. Thank you all for blessing my family today with your presence. I stand here before you as an act of obedience. The Lord had put on my heart months ago that I would be here on this day honoring my dad, my earthly father, and by doing that I'm honoring my heavenly father. And I'm beyond thankful. I am beyond thankful to be here with you all today honoring this man. I have this Bible, and I love it. My youngest son gave this to me. And I'm one of those people that writes in my Bibles. I highlight, I underline, I have just scriptures. I have everything that is in this Bible. I write prayers, I take notes. Sometimes I just write dates of, of the readings that I'm, of the verses I'm reading that day. And this Bible went with me to Israel in 2010. And I even have snapshots. Kathy DeLong. I even have snapshots of the Holy Land in this Bible. When I was in Israel, I visited the Wailing Wall, which is also called the Western Wall. People come from all around the world to tuck heartfelt prayers on tiny scraps of paper into the crevices of these walls. And there's a prayer for my dad's salvation in that wall. God knew the cry of my heart was salvation for my dad. 
written in this Bible on September 23rd, 2012, I wrote the following. God spoke to me today during the song, Mighty to Save. If any of you know it, you'll remember it when you hear it again. But he spoke to me. God spoke to me with those words, and he said he would save my dad. And I just thanked Jesus for that. Then this verse followed. So then just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. It's Colossians 2, 6, and 7. October 4th, 2013, I wrote this in my Bible. Dear Lord, please hear the cry of my heart. I pray for salvation. I pray for heaven. I pray for eternity for my dad. My dad loved his family. He was a great dad, but he was an even greater grandfather. He said if he'd known how much fun grandkids were, he would have had them first. <laughs> he was a surrogate father to my two longtime best friends. And he called them his daughters also. He was so happy to have my sister and my niece move back to California from Oregon. He had a new audience for his old stories. And Catherine liked to drink coffee with him, so that was a bonus. And man, my dad could drink coffee. He drank three pots of coffee a day. Not cups, but pots of coffee a day. The doctors told him he needed to drink more water, and he said, I drink black water all day long. I add cream and sugar to it, and I drink it all day. That man really enjoyed the coffee. After all those years in the Air Force, around all those planes, my dad's hearing suffered. He begrudgingly wore hearing aids that may or may not have truly aided him like to turn them off a lot. <laughs> I believe that most of the time he had them turned down and we have so many stories of things that my dad had misheard. But one of my favorites is at our old house we lived across the street from a new house that was built and their house caught on fire. It was struck by lightning and caught on fire. So in the middle of the night the doorbell's ringing and the door's pounding. These people are trying to get in. And my dad opens the door, no hearing aids. And there is the family, Jeff, Denise, Amber, <coughs> Emily, and Justin White standing in the rain crying. And Jeff White says, Emery, our house is on fire. And my dad says, you need a spare tire? <laughs> And that is a true story. <laughs> um, my dad had a soft spot for the homeless and especially veterans. So he would keep bags of clothes in his trunk and pass out blankets or coats, even socks, when he would see someone down on their luck. Well, my dad always wanted to be buried dressed up in a suit or even his dinner jacket or a tuxedo because he loved getting dressed up and taking my mom out. So as we were looking for clothes for him to wear, I had in mind this white dinner jacket. You'll see it in the video. Could not find it. So I think there may be a homeless man wandering the city in my dad's white dinner ja jacket. So if you see him, <laughs> on Thursday, January 23rd, we were at the oncologist and received some bad news. The doctor had given my dad four to six months. My dad said, well, I choose the six months then. That was Thursday. On Friday, we'd taken my mom to her hair appointment. 
as we usually did. And while she was getting herself all beautiful for her man, my dad and I sat in the car waiting. Now, as you've heard, my dad could tell a good story. And I mean, he remembered every tidbit of everything about that story. Who was there, what they wore, what time it was, the date, the year he was, it was uncanny. It was obviously the best times of his life. All those Air Force memories. He led such a rich and colorful life that we often asked him to let us videotape him. And he'd say, I don't have anything important to say. I'm not a hero. Nobody wants to hear what I have to say. Nope, he wouldn't do it. But that day, sitting in front of the beauty parlor, in my car, my dad starts telling me some more stories, and one of them I had never heard. So I secretly turn on the video of my phone, and I begin to videotape the last of his stories he ever told. Toward the end of this service, you'll see a video that my son and nieces have put together, the very beginning of that video, as a snippet of the conversation that, with my dad that day. I believe that was the beginning of God's plan to soften his heart. The following Saturday, my dad went to the hospital. Monday evening, Dan, the love of my life, and my son David surrounded my dad's hospital bed. And my husband was bold enough to lead my dad in prayer. And through that act of love, my dad came to accept the Lord. And through that acceptance, we know that we will be re reunited in heaven with him. That my mom, who is also a believer, will be reunited with her best friend and soulmate again. That all, that all who believe have, who that have accepted the Lord will be rejoicing in heaven with my dad again. Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them that are called according to his purpose. This was my dad's purpose. I'd like to ask a question. It's kind of out of the ordinary. But if you've ever prayed for my dad, for his salvation, for his healing, for his comfort, will you raise your hands? This is the power of prayer. This is what love looks like. And I thank you for that. This is what God's faithfulness, faithfulness looks like. He's exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ever ask for or desire. And he never ceases to amaze me. My family has been beyond blessed to have my parents live with us for the past 10 years. And I've learned a lot from them as a couple. I can tell you that this man loved this woman his whole entire life. That the sun rose and set with her in mind. That he would make her tea every morning and know just the right amount of sugar and milk to put in it. That he would set three marshmallows in a bowl by her bedside every night because he knew they were her favorite that he would wake every morning at 8 a.m. to give her her first morning medication, that he would kiss her goodnight every night, that he would discuss their plans for the following day to see how they would spend their day together. He would go to all her nail appointments, hair appointments, doctor's appointments with her and sit in the car and wait, that he would drop everything he was doing to get her anything her heart desired that he would sleep with only one hearing aid in every night to make sure that he could hear her if she needed anything in the middle of the night. That they would finish each other's sentences 
that he wanted to fight this cancer to stay by her side as long as he could. That he would open every door for her, that he would gently lead her by putting his hand at the small of her back, that even during chemo he would fight me to take the walker, to take her walker out of the trunk of the car. That he would be the first, first one out of the car to help her, that even as sick as he was on that last Saturday in the emergency parking lot, he still tried to get out of the car to help her. That's what love looks like. Even laying in that hospital bed, he was concerned. Was she comfortable enough? Was she warm enough? Did she have enough oxygen? Did she take her medication? He always put my mom first. That evening, that even during the final hours, he would pat the bed, looking for her hand. And when he found it, he would touch her wedding rings and spin them on her finger. I believe he was still professing his undying love to her, even there were no longer words to be spoken. He was her man, and she was his woman. He was committed to her, and she to him. Even knowing each other only six weeks before marrying, they promised to stay together forever, and they did. This is what love looks like. I want to thank my mom and dad for honoring each other all the days of their lives. <coughs> So thankful that that God and His faithfulness saw to it that He accepted Christ, and um, we know He's in heaven. And this song, "Amazing Grace," is so special today, especially because I know that if He was here, He'd be singing these words.
thoughts with you from Psalms 23. You know, the day before you know, Emory passed away, uh, Dan, I don't remember if you called me or texted me, um, asking me to come and for one last effort try to lead this wonderful man uh, to Christ. And I was out of town and couldn't make it. And uh, it's just God's way. He knows. He knew who needed to be there, and it was you. Uh, you were the one who he had seen, who he had walked with, he'd seen love his daughter. And God used you uh, to, to share just uh, God's wonderful grace uh, with him. And I just want you to know I'm proud of you as your friend, uh, that you were able to do that and uh, to serve him well. Um, I, was, I was talking with Dan, you know, Dan and I are friends, um, and we like to mountain bike together and hang out together. And I was asking him, you know, what was, what was you know, Emory's hang up? Uh, about becoming a Christian, and let me give you a summary answer. He had met some, so that was supposed to be funny. You can laugh at that. <laughs> Feel free. I'm a Christian. You can laugh at me. It's fine. <laughs> but you know, I think that I know that obviously Emory um, was not a religious uh, person for almost all of his life. Some of you, as his friends, are not religious people, and oftentimes we're turned off to religion because of those who practice it, um, and we can become critical of faith because of those who claim the faith. And, and I want you to know, I, I really think there's one or two options as you look at hypocritical Christians. One option is to say, yep, it's fake. It's a joke, it's just, I'm not religious, and you can write it off. The other option, and this is the option that I choose, is it makes me realize that even the best of people who are trying their hardest need a savior. It's very clear that humanity is very, very broken. We've heard a lot of wonderful, wonderful stories uh, about Emory, and I believe that they're true. I didn't know the guy personally. I saw him frown at me, I think, once or twice when I was preaching <laughs> at Woodcrest, you know, because his daughter dragged him there, and I was appreciative. Grandma smiled. I felt the love. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's not in heaven because he was a hero, which he was. He's not in heaven because he loved his wife all his life, which he did. Uh, he's not in heaven because he was an amazing father, which he was, or an amazing grandfather, which he was. Uh, he's in heaven because at the last moment he realized what my prayer is that you would all realize that we're all sinners and we need to be saved and he in an act of contrition as a brave man before he went home to meet God face to face gave his life to Jesus and did something odd I heard turned the channel to Christian television which is always risky I'm just going to say it's always risky <laughs> I wouldn't advise that if some of you are looking for faith. You never know what you're going to get. But he did that in the hospital. Uh, and he was surrounded by people of faith, in a hospital of faith, where people ministered to him and cared for him. And what I want to share with you is that today is really not for him because he's with the Lord. Today is really for us in our suffering, in our pain, in, in our loss. Um, and I hope that at some time in your life you could find faith. So moments like this can be a joy. I was sharing with you guys uh, the other night, I think it was your oldest son, we were talking about weddings and you thought, well, don't you, wouldn't you rather do a wedding? I said, absolutely not. And it's not because I'm like Captain Doom or anything like that. It's just funerals are a unique opportunity to deal with the fact that we're all gonna die. This will be all of us at one time. And we need to deal with that reality. No one lives forever. Every one of us will die, and we will stand before our Maker. Whether you believe Him or not, you will meet Him. He made you, and you will be held accountable for the life that you lived. The mistake that many people do is we, we live our lives comparing ourselves to others. If we look at Emory's life, he's probably one of the best of us, maybe the best one here. But we don't get to compare ourselves to each other. We don't get graded on a curve. We get graded by the standard of Jesus Christ who was perfect in every way, who was tempted like we are and yet did not sin. And so what I want to offer up to you as a believer, for those of you who are believers, I think you'll appreciate this. For those of you who are not believers and not men and women of faith, I hope this provides some level of comfort. It comes to us out of Psalms 23 and is written by a man named David. Now, if you've gone to a secular school or a school that attacks faith, you've been told that David is a fictitious character and I'm glad to tell you that once again in the country of Israel this year, they found another piece of pottery dating thousands of years old, and it has his name on it. Which proves once again that no matter how educated you are, you can still be a fool. He was a real king. He was a real man who served a real God and who had real pain just like you and I do. And he wrote these words that probably are the most famous words 
in the history of the world. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This is probably the most famous line. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and you anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days in my life. And probably the most, one of the most important sentences in the Bible, David concludes this short psalm with these words, And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Nothing can separate us, the Bible says, from the love of God, except our choice. Because love does not demand its own way. It lets us choose. Emory had a choice to make on the last day of his life. Let's all praise God and thank God he had the opportunity to make it. I would challenge you to not be so risky. And I would challenge you to make a decision and not hope that at the last moment you get this opportunity. God will, because God will, Emory was conscious and clear and was ready in those last moments. But I don't know what it will be like for you or for me. So I hope that you can reach out to God and be comforted. Because the reality is, you know, we read Psalms 23 at funerals, which is an odd verse because Emory's not walking through the valley of the shadow of death. He is dead. We're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. We're watching this. We're witnessing this. We're seeing this. We're experiencing this. Some of us, or one of us is bearing a husband. Some of us are bearing a father. Many of us are bearing a grandfather. We're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But David says, I will fear no evil. And understand, death is evil. The book of Revelation, the last book of Bible, says the last enemy to be defeated is death. This is not God's will. This is not God's plan. This is a result of our sin. This was not the way it was supposed to be. That's why we hurt that's why we long. Even after 84 years, it's not like we're, you know, we're bearing a child today. He lived 84 years. He lived a vibrant, long, loving life. And yet you see the tears of his daughter, the tears of his grandsons. Why? Because 84 years is still not enough. Why is that? Why do we have this inherent thing inside of us that says this shouldn't end? It's because God has put eternity in our hearts. And just as a fish knows he was made for water. The human soul knows that we were made to live forever. And I would encourage you to wrestle with that and pray through that so that you can be comforted in this moment. So that you will fear no evil, not even death. Even if you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. David ends with these words. He says, I know goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Because Emory placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Goodness and mercy have followed him into eternal life. And he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Eternity began for him this week. This week. My prayer for you is that when you face your death, when you face your time, you will be comforted to know that this is not the end, but it's simply the next chapter in forever. And I believe that, and I am comforted by that, and I hope that you will be as well. I'm going to pray and we're going to watch a presentation uh, by the family just remembering his life as we celebrate a life well lived. And then after that, I'm going to come back out and introduce. Uh, he's got some military accompaniment and they're going to celebrate his life uh, through a military presentation. But let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for these people. Uh, God, my heart goes out uh, to his wife, his daughters, to his grandchildren, to his family. Lord, and to his friends. But God, in this moment, I pray that we would all be comforted in Jesus' name. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. We thank you for that, Lord Jesus. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort us all in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I guess we have had a guardian angel. So I said, you call it lucky, I call it blessed. Mm -hmm.
I said, Grandpa wants this picture here. It's all black and white. And it ain't real clear as that you there. He said, yeah, I was a loving. And times were tough back in 35. That's me and Uncle Joe just trying to survive a cotton farm. And a great depression. If it looks like we were scared to death Like a couple of kids just trying to save each other You should have seen it in color Oh, and this one here was taken overseas In the middle of hell in 1943 Almost see my breath. That was my tail gunner, old Johnny McGee. He was a high school teacher from New Orleans, and he had my back right through the day we left. If yeah, it looks like we were scared to death, like a couple of kids just trying to save each other. Should have seen it in color A picture's worth a thousand words But you can't see what those shades of gray keep cover You should have seen it in This is me and Grandma in the summer sun All dressed up the day we said our vows You can't tell here, but it was hot that June That rose was red and her eyes were blue And just look at that smile I was so proud That's the story of my life Right there in black and white And if it looks like we were scared to death Like a couple of kids just trying to save each other You should have seen it in color You should have seen it in color You should have seen it in color Your picture's worth a thousand words But you can't see what those shades of gray keep cover You should have seen it in color Daddy tells religiously Like clockwork every time He sees an opening In a conversation About the way things used to be well, I just roll my eyes And make a beeline for the door But I'd always end up starry-eyed Cross-legged on the floor Hanging on to every word 
man the things I heard It was harder times and longer days Five miles of school uphill both ways We were cane switch raised a dirt floor poor Of course that was back before the war Yeah, your uncle and I made quite a pair Flying F-15s through hostile air He went down, but they missed me by hair He'd always stop right there and say That's something to be proud of That's a life you can hang your hat on That's your chin held high as a tear falls down Guts up dead, chest up out Like a small town flag a-flying Or a newborn baby crying In the arms of the woman that you love That's something to be proud of Son graduating college, that was mama's dream But I was on my way to anywhere else when I turned 18 Cause when you got a fast car You think you got everything but I learned quick those GTOs don't run on faith and I ended up broken down in some town north of L.A. Working maximum hours For minimum wage Well I fell in love next thing I know the Babies came and the car got sucked Sure do miss that old hot rod But you sure save gas in them foreign jobs Dad I wonder if I ever let you down If you're ashamed how I turned out Well he lowered his voice Then he raised his brow Said, let me tell you right now. That's something to be proud of. That's a life you can hang your hat on. You don't need to make a million. Just be thankful to be working. If you're doing what you're able, and putting food there on the table, and providing for the family that you love, that's something to be proud of.
to the sea, to the open arms of the sea.
ladies and gentlemen, completing the main standing. About to hear a series of rifle volleys. They can be rather loud, so if you have sensitive hearing or young children, please protect your ears now. Additionally, upon the plane of TAPS, any current or former military, please render one final hand salute. All others, please place your right hand over your heart. Thank you. Please be seated. 